Um, welcome back to the second panel of the day. Um, I'm going to introduce the panel and try to keep everything going on time, and then ideally there'll be lots of time for questions. Um, let me introduce the first speaker, Cécile Alduy. She's a professor of French literature and culture at Stanford and also a research fellow at Sciences Po in Paris. She's a specialist of political rhetoric and especially the discourse of the far right. She's, her last book was published in 2017 in French and addressed the discourses of the main candidates in the 2017 French, pre French pre presidential election, which just took place in May. Um, and she is also the author of Marine Le Pen, Taken to Her Words, Deciphering the New National Front's Discourse, out from Soy in 2015. Thank you. Thank you. So if, uh, like me, you compared the French and American political landscapes just about a year ago, and um, we're trying to see where the wind was blowing, I hope you didn't bet any money. Um, in September 2016, there were concerns in France about the very good polling numbers of far-right candidate Marine Le Pen. In fact, for a straight year, she had been leading the polls for the 2017 presidential race, and momentum was on her side. By contrast, that's her curve, polling numbers. By contrast here, the odds seem to be stacked against Trump, or so we were told. Of course, the rest is history. In France, Emmanuel Macron, a cultural liberal pro-Europe centrist, won in a landslide against Marine Le Pen with 65% of the votes. Thereafter, the National Front spiraled down and crashed at a miserable 13% of the votes in the following congressional elections in June, landing exactly where it was five years before. You know what happened here in 2016 and 17 and last August. So it would be comforting to declare the French far right obsolete and harmless, at least in comparison to the American alt-right's resurgence. But doing so, we would risk repeating the same mistakes that left many of us off guards on November 8, 2016. We would risk suffering five years from now when new elections happen in France from the same lack of vigilance that, that led in part to Trump's victory. Sure, there was a sigh of relief when Marine Le Pen failed to get, to get even close to the presidency in France, but we should not confuse electoral setbacks and cultural impregnation, short-term indicators such as elections and long-term ideological trends. Nor should we mistake the cleaned up palatable discourse that Marine Le Pen has refurbished her party with, with the party's core ideology and its continuous affiliation with a galaxy of radical networks that sustain her and will be waiting for payback when the time comes. What I want to examine today is the state of the cultural war in France between the radical right in and around the National Front and on the other hand, the democratic, humanist, anti-racist camp. I take Marine Le Pen's party and its evolution as a symptom, as much as a catalyst, of recent trends in public opinion. And by examining its official message, its underlying ideology, but also the outside networks and actors that foster its success, I hope to paint a more accurate picture of the ecology of xenophobia in France and to assess its traction or decline. I'm first going to look at the front, uh, National Front itself, and then I'll turn my attention to some of the political and cultural actors that participate to its normalization. So first, how new is the new National Front? Here I want to put into question two reassuring narratives that I think mask the entrenchment of racist prejudices in large segments of French society. The first narrative is that the National Front's rise has been stopped in its tract in the 2017 electoral cycle. The second one is that of a de-diabolisation or detoxification of the party since Marine Le Pen took over from her father in 2011. Let's first dispel the first fallacy of a weak National Front. Defeat is not the same as decline. The 2017 electoral results were disappointing only compared to opinion polls that preceded it, that preceded them, but certainly not compared to the history of the party at large. This graph tells anything but the story of a decline. Between 2002, the last time that the National Front 
got to the second round of the presidential election in 2017, the far-right party has doubled its political weight, gaining 5 million voters out of 47 million voters uh, across the board and 16 percentage points. Between the first and the second round of this election cycle, Marine Le Pen was first at 7 million and gained 3 million additional voters in the second round in spite of record low turnout and a call by every other party to vote against her. By contrast, um, so we have the comparison here, Jean-Marie Le Pen barely improved his score by less than a percentage point in 2002 in the face-off. So the question, once we have acknowledged this remarkable winning streak, is to understand what it means to vote Marine Le Pen today as opposed to Jean-Marie Le Pen yesterday. And this is where the second reassuring narrative comes in, that of a new national front, which would not be that toxic or racist anymore. And I'm gonna start with an anecdote that speaks to the perception that father and daughter are two different beasts. In April 2015, days after a historic victory of the National Front in local elections, Jean-Marie Le Pen found nothing better to do than to reiterate his 1987 statement that the Holocaust was, I quote, a detail in the history of World War II. A week later, he went on to extol the Vichy regime in the anti-Semitic weekly Rivarol, where he also expressed his sympathy for those who fight against democracy, denounced the gay lobby, and lamented the demise of the white world. Needless to say, this didn't go too well with public opinion, but what was surprising is that it caused a storm within the National Front. Her father's adburst was flying in the face of Marine Le Pen's patient work of dédiabolisation, um, an effort to rebrand the National Front as mainstream. And just a few months before the presidential race was going to start, she couldn't take the risk of having her father's old style outburst fly in her face and be an obstacle to her rise. So Jean-Marie Le Pen was officially suspended and then kicked out from the party that he himself had, found, had founded in 1972. Not only that, but this political parasite was staged and broadcast live on primetime television for maximum political dividends. Days after the Rivarol interview, Marine Le Pen signed her father's political death warrant on TF1 NewsHour. What has gone unnoticed in this political assassination is that to condemn her father, she invoked a set of arguments that are entirely foreign to the National Front old style. To justify her rather overdue condemnation of her father's racial views, she quoted what she called the political line of the party. I quote, the National Front contributes to the expression of suffrage within the framework defined by the Republic and within democratic pluralism. It is attached to equality before the law of every French citizen, regardless of origin, race, or religion. On TV, it looked like Marine Le Pen was siding with universalist and Republican values against her father's racialist politics. But was she using a rhetoric of humanism or issuing a genuine humanistic statement? So I try to answer this question as methodologically as possible by combing over 500, 500 texts, 1.5 million words of both father and, uh, and daughter. And uh, the result of this rather gruesome labor was that from a lexical point of view, it is true that there is a marked difference between father and daughter. It is a fact that Marine Le Pen has entirely crossed out from her speech the most retrograde, visibly discriminatory lexical markers of the far right. Antisemitism, misogyny, and biological racism are out. Not once does she use the words black or Arab, and when she uses Jewish, it is conde to condemn the Holocaust in the most unambiguous manner, or to defend, I quote, our Jewish fellow citizens end quote, against the alleged anti-Semitism of the banlieue. In a remarkable 180 degree turn compared to her God-invoking pro-life father, she has positioned herself as the champion of laicite, or secularism, and of minorities, or at least some minorities. However, a closer analysis shows that this lexical makeover is deceptive and might be even more dangerous or pernicious than Jean-Marie Le Pen's outward racism. She abides by the letter while violating the spirit of the universalist values she pretends to uphold. 
In a quasi Orwellian fashion, Marine Le Pen manages to make words mean the opposite of the, what they were truly intended to convey. So for instance, with incredible aplomb, the champion of national preference praised cultural diversity in September 2016. The world will survive only through human, cultural, and biological diversity, she said, and she added to a lot of people's surprise, yes to multiculturalism. But the end of her sentence dispelled any doubt about her true opinions regarding a melting pot society. Yes to multiculturalism at the level of the planet, no to multiculturalism within a single country. So defending cultural diversity in her mouth means excluding it entirely from the boundaries of a unifying Christian world, a Christian nation. And while some signifiers are emptied out of their original meaning, others stretched to new levels of semantic elasticity. In particular, the words culture and identity have become the new politically correct synonyms for race. But suppressing the word race from one's vocabulary is not the same as renouncing a race-based ideology. Xenophobia and a biological definition of citizenship remain the ideological core of the National Front's platform. Today, like before, the party proposes to abolish entirely the jus solis, the right to become a citizen of the country you were born in, in favor of jus sanguinis only, that is citizenship by blood and lineage. And it would restrict naturalizations and immigration to almost zero in a clear effort to preserve the purity of the French nation. So we can take maybe a moment to think about what does this racism without the word race means in terms of the state of the culture war in France. If we read Marine Le Pen's newly found leftist uh, pedigree in light of a much broader long-term battle between anti-racist and racist agenda, her adoption of a secular, feminist, and human rights lexicon speaks to the cultural hegemony in France of ethical and political norms that were once the prerogative of the new left. And on the one hand, it's probably good news that the silent revolution described by Hingelhart has transformed the National Front itself. It's a good measure of democracy's robustness that even the far right knows that it would be political suicide to run on an, an anti-Semitic and racist agenda. But on the other hand, hiding a hate-based, race-based platform under the thin veil of a universalist lexicon might sap even more dangerously the foundations of French democracy. When public opinion perceives the National Front's discourse as normal, because it cannot be singled out as easily as a deviation from the political norm, the risk is that xenophobia itself becomes mainstream. And now I'm going to turn to the broader cultural context where her discourse has been normalized by the, from the outside. Um, in the last 10 to 15 years, the political discourse at large has drifted to the right dramatically. To, just, uh, to list just a few um, political actors who have adopted the National Front's axioms, we have on the right former minister Nadine Morano, who spoke of France as a white race country, and on the left, then Prime Minister Manuel Valls stigmatized the Roma population as being prone to stealing, impossible to integrate, and entirely unwelcome. About Muslims, he said, I quote, I wished we could demonstrate that Islam is compatible with the Republic, end quote, implying therefore that it was not yet the case. In 2016, far-left presidential candidate Jean-Luc Mélenchon stigmatized East European detached workers as, I quote, stealing the bread of French people. This new rhetoric, saturated with a profound animosity for foreigners in general, and Islam in particular, is reinforced by a galaxy of radical right influencers. And the paradox here is that at the same time that the National Front has internalized the lexical taboos that Jean-Marie Le Pen so gleefully transgressed, actors outside of the party have embarked explicitly on a cultural war to promote a nativist agenda. And first among these actors are, uh, is Eric Zemmour, whom I will take as a case study. Zemmour has made a, a name for himself at a very lucrative career as a polemicist. He's adopting the uh, exact opposite uh, rhetorical strategy as Marine Le Pen, where she has sugarcoated her most questionable positions 
he professes to be in the truth telling business and in a kind of reinformation mission similar to Steve Bannon's Breitbart News. But the difference between, uh, with Breitbart News is that Zemu has been broadcasting his arguments on primetime television and in mainstream media. At one point, he could comment weekly, um, you know, in the same week, on a radio uh, channel in the morning, on two uh, talk shows in the evening, uh, in the magazine, uh, Figaro magazine, and he had his own talk show on Saturday um, at primetime hour. And his bestseller, uh, French Suicide, sold 500,000 copies in 2014. The argument of the book is that the Vichy regime should be praised for having supposedly saved French Jews and that France is doomed because of the emasculation of the white European male. Eric Zemmour's notoriety matter, matters because of the content, medium, and semantics of his discourse. In the rising ecology of hate that I am describing, he fulfills a unique role as interpreter, influencer, and prescriber of radical political opinions to a mass, mass audience. In terms of content, um, he offers a simple clash of civilizations narrative through which to read the world. In his last book, Un Caca Napoléon, a mandate for nothing, Chronicles of the War of Civilizations, he argues that France and Europe have entered a civil war between its Judeo-Christian native population and its Muslim population, uh, immigrants. This interpretive grid prepares the public for the most drastic of measures once the right political leader comes into play. In a 2014 interview, Zemmour envisaged in earnest deporting five million French Muslims to avoid a civil war. But even before this acculturation of prejudices can bear fruits in the long run, it also serves key functions in the ecology of the far right. On the one hand, Zemmour's blunt statement makes Marine Le Pen look moderate and center, by contrast, instead of far right and extreme. On the other hand, he hammers home only more crudely the very subtext of her ideological worldview, and he does so on legitimate media platforms that broadcast to the mass public. Another role of Zemmour is that of interpreter, not of history, but of Marine Le Pen's quoted lingua. He states in simpler, more candid terms, Marine Le Pen's euphemisms. For instance, when, he, when she urges to fight a quote, crime, real crime, the one that has been prospering for so many years in our banlieue, or when she stigmatizes <coughs> these youth that are at war with France without naming exactly who she has in mind, Zemmour translates bluntly, it's normal that French from immigrant roots be controlled more often by the police because most drug dealers are blacks or Arabs. That's a fact, end quote. Zemmour's more explicit style is particularly helpful to unpack Marine Le Pen's cementing reworking of the words Islam and immigration. When he explains, I quote, there is no difference between Islam and Islamism. French Islam is an oxymoron because Islam means submission and the word French comes from Frank, which means free. The next 30 years are bound to bring either civil war or submission. He gives us the key to decode Marine Le Pen's more elliptical illusions. For instance, when she praised I quote, those who fight, those who die in the camping of terror that is intended to precede submissions. Equipped with Zemmour's etymologies, we can understand better why Marine Le Pen is so intent on just criticizing Islamisms in general, when she actually means Islam. To conclude, um, in France's radical right ecosystem, the National Front's new political leaders have adopted France's current discursive and legal norms to gain legitimacy in the ballot box, while other players who can expect a financial and notoriety boost from polemics and hyperbole take care of the other part of the job, the indoctrination of the minds. In other words, not only the National Front had a record high in terms of votes, not only is it not a cleaned up humanist party in spite of what it pretends to be, not only do new voters come to it for the same xenophobic reasons as the old voters, but its xenophobic agenda is even more widespread than what we think. A national front at 35% might be just the tip of the iceberg. Thank you. And our last speaker of this panel today is Marcus Fool, who is a historian and the Graduate Program Director and Research Associate at the Zentrum für Antisemitismusforschung 
at the Technische Universität of Berlin, uh, and he's been in that position since 2011. And from 2006 to 2010, he was the DAAD visiting professor at York University in Toronto. He is a historian of the political right and of conservative elites in Germany since in the modern period, since 1800, and is currently working on a book-length essay on the historical foundations of multiculturalism in Germany. Thank you very much. I have to put things in order first here. So uh, we are entering a stage at, the, uh, at this conference where uh, it's getting increasingly difficult to say something absolutely new. Um, but I'm trying to by um, presenting a case that in many regards uh, seems to be exceptional. I will talk about uh, Germany and uh, the formation uh, of a new right and the conditions so, uh, of this formation of the new right uh, uh, in uh, Germany. Germany is an exceptional case because it is the land where the Nazis actually had been in power, um, terrorizing um, any political opposition, discriminating um, all sorts of people that were not um, perceived part of the Volksgemeinschaft, unleashing uh, the Second World War, and finally uh, planning and executing um, the murder of uh, European Jews. But it is also um, an exceptional case because despite all shortcomings and setbacks, uh, at least or at the latest since the mid-1980s, uh, this country um, has taken up responsibility for, uh, the for its National Socialist part to such an extent that uh, anti-Nazism and anti-anti-Semitism um, have become cornerstones of uh, the uh, political culture. Um, this is, for example, reflected in a very dynamic and all-encompassing uh, memory culture. And any one of you who might have been to Berlin uh, uh, yet and have kind of seen um, the uh, presence of the memorial landscape uh, uh, in, the, in the city will have an impression of, uh, uh, of that. Um, also, uh, Germany uh, has implemented uh, quite strict laws against Holocaust denial and against, um, I mean, almost, uh, well, uh, against forms of anti-Semitism related to uh, uh, Nazism, uh, even to an extent that free speech is limited in that uh, uh, regard. It also has implemented laws that um, well, practically ban um, the use of Nazi symbols and Nazi language in uh, the public uh, space. Uh, secondly, um, the while well, neo-Nazis, so I mean, uh, well, in the in the in the, in the uh, 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 stricter sense of the term, have been quite successfully marginalized and uh, um, uh, put to the fringes of uh, a society. A new right, a so-called new right, has uh, emerged, and it's trying to get entry into the uh, kind of political discourse and the political system through uh, a new party that was founded only a few years ago, the Alternative für Deutschland, the Alternative for Germany. But still, I mean, we, we have an upcoming election, federal election in uh, two weeks, and um, I mean, I know we shouldn't rely on polls anymore, but uh, it can be expected for quite sure that 90% of the votes will go to political parties, to, to, will go to democratic political parties and uh, not to uh, uh, the uh, new right-wing uh, party. So believe it or not, Germany has over the, um, well, last uh, 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 years established um, one of the most stable 
political systems in the uh, Western world, even uh, at the cost uh, that we're having uh, one woman rule for 12 years now, and uh, most likely, uh, almost sure, for another four years. Um, third, um, and I think this is a very important point, it has, it has been mentioned yesterday too, uh, Germany has a functioning uh, democratic conservative party um, that sticks to the fundaments of human decency as well as to the idea and to the values of a pluralistic society. And I mean, in all countries where right-wing movements have kind of entered the governmental sphere, um, they had kind of cooperated with deteriorating conservative parties. And um, I mean, this is all credits to Angela Merkel in that case. The Conservative Party in Germany has drawn a strict, clear red line not to get into any talks and coalitions with a party that sits right uh, uh, from uh, them. And fourth, there is a deep knowledge, at least in the western part of, uh, of uh, uh, Germany, um, that Germany is one of those countries that um, has been benefiting most from these long-term processes of internationalization and uh, Europeanization. I mean, this was kind of the entry uh, a ticket back to the international world after World War II, uh, kind of integrating into international uh, 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 structure, in particular, the, uh, what then became the European uh, Union. And finally, uh, over the years, at least since the 1960s, Germany has developed a very strong, critical civil society, and that includes a critical media. Um, ironically, uh, I've spoken to many uh, colleagues from uh, other countries under stress. Um, ironically, Germany has become, to some outside observers, uh, a sort of a last resort or a hope of, uh, the, uh, 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 of the liberal West. And who would have thought, uh, maybe, not, well, not only after 45, but uh, a generation ago, that we would end up in such a situation. Um, so I would say Germany is an example um, for the possibility uh, of historical learning and profound change in, and sustainable change in uh, political culture. However, so to be sure, um, there exists, as I mean the paper that had been read out uh, by Jeff Ely uh, uh, pointed out to some extent, there exists um, kind of every day, as well as institutionalized racism and also widespread anti-Muslim resentment uh, among the German population. There exists um, solid anti-Semitic resentments, so solid and stable anti-Semitic resentments across society. Um, there are frequent outbreaks of xenophobic violence, attacks on refugee shelters, or um, maybe you've heard about that um, there existed the, uh, this murderous uh, so-called National Socialist Underground, a terrorist, a Nazi uh, a terrorist group that um, murdered uh, 11 um, Germans with a, a migrant uh, a background over a time span of about uh, 10 years, and there is widespread hate speech, uh, particularly in social media, as, uh, I mean, this is a general phenomenon, as in other parts of the uh, Western world. But this talk is not about these activities. This talk is about the uh, new right, so the self-fashioned new right, and its uh, strategic as well as ideological reorientation, understood by them as a prerequisite to enter uh, German mainstream discourse uh, uh, first, because, well, it is virtually uh, banned uh, uh, from this uh, discourse so far. Secondly, I will briefly discuss then the inconsistencies and contradictions of these positions and how they are actually connected to historical uh, uh, national socialism. And then I will use um, four short case studies if I have time, but uh, I'll try to do so, to demonstrate how this folkish thought of the new right has entered 
the uh, alternative for uh, Deutschland and to what extent this uh, party has become a political arm of the extra-parliamentary uh, new right. Um, after World War II, in the shadow of the activities of former Nazis uh, and then neo-Nazi uh, neo-Nazis, intellectual of intellectuals of the far right started to reorient themselves. So they set themselves apart from these neo-Nazi activities. The most important person in that early period, uh, beginning in the 1950s, was actually a Swiss-born historian named Armin Mohler. Um, he was actually the private secretary of Ernst Dünger, a famous uh, uh, author of a uh, uh, kind of heroic author that so, sort of glorified uh, the war experience in World War I, worked then well into National Socialism uh, uh, um, and fared well actually under the uh, Nazis. Um, he published a book in the 1950s uh, entitled The Conservative Revolution where he tried to homogenize anti-liberal and anti-democratic authors of the interwar period and separating, separating them from Nazi ideology. Um, he tried to reintroduce these authors uh, into the canon of uh, conservative thought. And um, among these authors are Oswald Spengler, the author of The uh, Decline of the West, Untergang des Abendlandes in German, the uh, uh, um, uh, Karl Schmidt, uh, the notorious uh, um, lawyer and uh, well, lawyer of the Führer actually, uh, 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 and a supporter of the Nazis until the mid 1930s. Arthur Möller von dem von dem Bruck, who created the term Third Reich, uh, or Edgar Julius Jung, who published a book in the 1920s entitled. Um, the, uh, the rule of the inferior, um, an attack against uh, uh, um, the Weimar Republic. So these pre-Nazi authors um, are the most, and still are mo the most eminent historical referent, uh, uh, reference points of the new right's political thought. Um, how does the, I mean, this is probably the most important question, how does the so-called new right distance itself from Nazism? First of all, most importantly, they turned away from anti-Semitism and biological racism um, as kind of core of their ideology. Instead, they are promoting so-called ethno-pluralism saying that there are races, there are, uh, uh, but these races are not uh, 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 unequal, they are e kind of equally uh, uh, worth, but they need to be separated. So it's the ideology of segregation. Um, secondly, certainly, and this, and this camouflage, the ideology of inequality that's, that's, behind, that's behind it. Then secondly, um, where is Mark? Uh, this uh, refers to his talk. Um, they reject kind of bold Holocaust denial and uh, distortion. Instead, they focus on attacking um, forms of established forms of Holocaust uh, remembrance. Um, so, just to to kind of catch works, I will uh, uh, talk about them uh, uh, in a couple of minutes. Like so, uh, um, the idea of uh, that uh, a Holocaust um, remembrance has become a Shoah business uh, um, from which uh, Jews all over the globe are profiting from. Um, or um, the accusation that Germany has adopted Holocaust remembrance as a new civic religion, um, replacing you know, other forms of religious uh, uh, belief. Then uh, another important point that refers to uh, actually Manuela's talk from yesterday, they had, have adopted the concept of metapolitics, um, with reference to Evola, but also to Gramsci, they are trying to slowly winning over cultural, or first access to uh, a public discourse, and then 
uh, uh, winning uh, cultural, hege uh, uh, cultural hegemony, so they're sitting back. They're not uh, kind of uh, uh, in action, as you might think, uh, uh, in regard to, 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 to Nazis, but sitting back, waiting, trying to uh, influence the um, uh, public discourse in a long-term um, perspective. That goes along with a general in intellectualization um, of the uh, movement, uh, including the rereading, um, denazifying, and reinterpretation of seminal works from German idealism, political romanticism, uh, to the above mentioned anti liberal authors. Uh, um, um, also, they're looking abroad. Um, I mean, some of the names have been uh, uh, have been have been mentioned. Uh, one I was missing, actually, or two there I, 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 I was missing, are uh, the French author uh, Renaud Camus, uh, who uh, created the term le grand remplacement, the great exchange. So the idea that European white population is kind of purposely uh, 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 replaced uh, by, um, well, non-white uh, uh, minorities. A very important uh, uh, book in, among, among these circles. Another name is uh, Russian, well, I don't want to say intellectual, Russian thinker, Alexander Dugin, uh, who has uh, um, uh, um, kind of renewed um, this idea Ideology or idea of a Eurasia, uh, Eurasian empire that would sit against uh, the United States of America or the West as an idea. Um, so this new right in Germany is actually referring to both of these authors um, among uh, 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 others. Um, then, uh, as I had indicated, rather than being kind of political activists, um, they try to inform political circles. It's kind of a very elitist concept. This is also something to do because they don't have any mass bases. Yeah, they, uh, they don't have brown shirts on the streets. So they're trying to influence uh, small intellectual circles that uh, work then into a broader, a broader public. And again, the Weimar Republic uh, 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 serves as a model there where such clubs already existed. Uh, Herrenclub, Ringclub, uh, if you might have heard of uh, these. Then, I th would say most interesting, they are adopting strategies uh, from the left. Um, we've seen some of the images. Oh, well, when we think of neo-Nazis, we have a certain image in mind. These guys don't look, they, they are not brown shirted. They, uh, they wave flags, but they don't wave swastikas. Well, it, they're forbidden in, in Germany, as I said. They, use, they look for other symbols. Yesterday, in a conversation, I mentioned that the Confederate flag actually is being used uh, uh, quite widely among these circles, but other uh, flags as well. Um, but if you look at their, uh, uh, um, uh, um, well, at their kind of uh, members, um, I mean, they look like uh, uh, who, who, uh, yeah, um, who are quite young. Um, they look like, I mean, have adopted hipster culture. Um, they come with humor and ease, and uh, so it's not that kind of violent appearance anymore, but a rather um, casual uh, uh, appearance. And I think that's a quite important change in, 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 uh, in appearance we also have to uh, uh, keep in mind. So I'm speaking of the so-called identitarian uh, movement that is very uh, active. And then, as a uh, last important point, they are trying to institutionalize um, um, uh, right-wing uh, thought by establishing professional networks, um, serious magazines, publishing houses, uh, 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 and even think tanks. So in Berlin, there is a so-called library of conservatism. I won't speak much about that, but very interesting place to go. And uh, in the, uh, some provincial place in Eastern Germany, um, Götz Kubitschek had founded, uh, so one of the actors in that scene, um, the so-called National Policy Institute um, that is uh, uh, accompanied with a, uh, with a publishing house where he tries to network, connect, bring um, 
people from abroad, from Germany, <coughs> from the political, from the alternative for Germany, together with uh, intellectuals of the uh, so-called <coughs> new uh, right. And actually, this is where the, uh, uh, the where the title of my talk is coming from: the widening of the thin line. Because in an, a quite influential uh, essay, um, uh, Kubitschek um, stated that. The new right in Germany is walking on a very thin line, and they, they need to work into the public discourse, they need to adopt a long-term strategy in order to widen the uh, uh, possibilities. So far, I think, um, I have to skip a little bit, there is, there is much hope. Um, that uh, this movement uh, is uh, 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 staying um, kind of uh, marginalized. First of all, because they don't really don't have a mass basis. There is no charismatic leader uh, uh, inside, which I think is quite important for these uh, uh, movements. There is a strong opposition coming from uh, civil society. And more important, uh, I think, is the uh, utter rejection um, uh, of these movements by uh, the democratic parties, uh, uh, including uh, the conservatives. And this just as a last remark, I just read today, and actually a conservative German newspaper, that the Ministry of Justice, which is led by a social democrat, together with the Ministry of the Interior, which is led by a conservative, are uh, preparing um, a lawsuit to, they want to bring it to the Constitutional Court to ban the Alternative for Deutschland after the election because of some anti democratic and uh, openly racist remarks some of their members had made in the, in the last week. So there is strong, uh, there is a strong re rejection from civil society as well as from the political elites in Germany. Thank you very much. Thank you.